Uh, sim, sim, prof, é que eu tô... Na minha tela não tem áudio aqui. Ah, tá, mas eu já, já vou iniciar lá agora. I already put... Oh, my God. Can you start? Yes, I'm ready, but I like like uh, 20 minutes ago, it looks like I okay. don't have the control of my screen. Okay, okay, I can start. So, uh, good night, everybody. First, I would like to to. Uh, I'm so sorry for the the delay. We have some technical problems, but fortunately, um, oh, we can solve this. And then, thank you very much for your patience. And I also would like to thank the patient of our, uh, of Je and Thiago that, uh, that are the stars of this night. So I will quickly introduce Dr. Josephine. And I'm, I'm, very, gl I'm very glad to, to, to introduce Dr. Josephine, uh, who is a recognized researcher of the Purinergic Signaling Uh, and also he's a friend and collaborator of Brazilian researchers. So, Jean was in Brazil many times. He's a specialist on purinergic signaling and uh, he's doing a, a great contribution uh, specifically on the NTPDA's knowledge. Uh, so I met, I would like to, to think, uh, to tell something about Jean, my personal uh, experience with Jean. I met him in 2006 at biochemistry department, and I had the opportunity to have my, to do my sandwich PhD course under his supervision during one year. During this time, we developed research aiming to better understand the participation of purinergic receptors on cytokine, on cytokine release by glioma cells. Since then, we continue to work in collaboration And we have published many papers studying the purinergic signaling in glioblastoma, glioblastoma progression, uh, focused mainly in CD73. We recently approved an internationalization grant project from, from FAPERGS, which made possible to send my student Dominique to a scientific mission in his lab. And just in the beginning of this year uh, and before the pandemic, we are very lucky about it. Jean also received my, my student Nicole for a summer school uh, three years ago. So I would like to thank you very much uh, to be here and uh, thank you much more for your patience uh, for this delay. Thank you so much. So you can, we can proceed with your talking that people are, all of people are wait, waiting for you. Okay, thanks Elise. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, good. Well, finally. Uh, so, Thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, thank, thank you also for, for taking the time for, for to attend my presentation. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, Elisandra and the organizing committee for the very nice opportunity given here to, to share with you some of the results we have done on one of our main project in the lab. So what I will present today is the identification and characterization of the last member of the nucleoside triphosphate diphosphatidylase family so ntp i will say ntpdas in this uh, in this talk uh, so i will show uh, also the function of the enzyme we found that the enzyme ntpdas 8 was important to protect the intestine during inflammation and i will conclude with uh, astonishing results uh, <laughs> that suggest that we can possibly use this pathway to uh, possibly treat patient that suffers from inflammatory bowel disease, so IBD. So uh, even if it was long to start, I, I please stay until the end to show these, uh, these results uh, because you don't take me for my words, just. <laughs> so the research of my lab focuses on the characterization of ectonucleotidases and more specifically on NTPDAs. And these enzymes are hydrolyzing nucleotides at the cell surface. So the importance of these enzymes will be to, to related to the substrate, to the nucleotides. Uh, so, so they are, it's, it relies on the fact that these nucleotides are present in all tissues 
and they are present uh, and also about their function. So this is what I will present in the next the next two slides. So it looks like it's frozen. Or someone can change my slides or it's like it's frozen. So either I, I stop and I start again. Just, just a moment, please. Oh my gosh. É. Roberto, o pessoal está falando que, que os slides não estão aparecendo aqui na apresentação também. Gente, vamos colocar todo mundo na sala, por favor, vamos fazer esse evento, senão daqui a pouco a gente vai ter que cancelar. Eu acho que sim. Ok, it's working. It's working now. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. You can see? Ok. Yes. So yes. on this slide, I'd like to show uh, the... Sorry, it was kind of frozen, so I did not have access to anything. Uh, on this slide, I would like to show the, the sources of nucleotides in... And this is an example. This, the example I take here is like a blood, a blood vessel. So any cells is a potential source of nucleotides. Uh, here in the blood, for example, we, ha we have platelets. And during the activation for thrombosis, to, to, to do the, the thrombus, they release huge amounts of nucleotides there. The dense granules in the platelets contain about contain half a molar of ATP and ADP. So this is huge concentration of nucleotides that, are, that is released during activation. Red blood cells and endothelial cells also release nucleotides upon shear stress or hypoxia or different many other conditions. And of course, as any cell has about five millimolar nucleotides in the, in the cytoplasma, so they can also release nucleotides upon lysis or death or apoptosis. And in the vascular wall, of course, uh, small muscle cells can release nucleotides and uh, nerve endings as well. So this is just an example that to show that any any uh, cell can release nucleotides uh, often in a specific manner and also uh, depending on the condition. So there are various conditions that can lead to the release of this. So once nucleotides are released outside the cells, what happens? These nucleotides can activate P2 receptors. I don't know if you can see my my arrow here. Uh, so these cells, uh, these nucleotides activate P2 receptors. So they are, they are eight, seven ionotropic P2X7 and eight uh, metabotropic P2Y receptors. And these nucleotides, ATP and also UTP, because they activate other types of, of these receptors, they can be hydrolyzed by ectonucleotidases. We have uh, my, my PhD led to the identification of the first member of the most important family of ectonucleotides, the NTPDAs, one at the time. And having ADP and UDP can activate other type of P2 receptors, one of the 15 other receptors. And this can be further hydrolyzed by these enzymes to lead finally to the production of adenosine from ecto 5 prime nucleotidase. And adenosine can activate P1 receptors that we find here. Uh, there are four types of adenosine receptors. So what is interesting here is that most often a P P2 receptors will trigger a response and adenosine receptors will do exactly the opposite. For example, P2 receptors are pro-inflammatory and one hydrolyzed completely to adenosine, ad adenosine uh, by activating P1 receptors and an is an anti-inflammatory. So depending on the enzyme that we have, uh, we can hydrolyze these nucleotides depending on the characteristic, the, the, the kinetics of these enzyme, of the different enzyme involved, depending on where we are, which cells express which receptor or which enzyme can lead to uh, a delay or very quick uh, activation of P1 receptors or, 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 or this. So this is the playground of my, of my lab in what we are working. 
Uh, we have a major focus on inflammation, as you, as you will see uh, in this talk. Uh, we work on mainly on the gastrointestinal system. So we work with the GI tract, with, uh, with the liver, and uh, also with the pancreas a little bit with some work in the di for about diabetes. And we work also with uh, neutrophils and macrophages uh, in inflammation about all of this. And another uh, important project of the lab is the regulation of smooth muscle contraction by, by, by these guys. So for example, P2 receptors induce a constriction while adenosine induce a dilatation. So, so this is what we were doing in the lab. So here I will talk about the inflammation of the intestine. And what brought us to this was first uh, that my during my PhD and postdoc studies, I I found that there was another type of these enzymes that did not did not correspond to what was known so far. So this was in the liver, but it was uh, we found that it was also expressed in the in the intestine. What I did at the time is to look for express sequence tags uh, in the liver to see if there was a gene that could look like NTPDAs, but not being NTPDAs about the one that were already known. And uh, the, at the time, the genome was not cloned. So yes, I know I'm old, uh, but uh, so we use ESTs and we found a gene. So we cloned this gene and we found that as expe we were expecting that because we were believing that it was in the same family as the other NTPDAs. And we found a protein with a large extracellular domain with the five apparatus conserved region that we can see uh, in all NTPDases, uh, two short intracellular uh, domain, and also several end-link glycosylation. So this is like very similar to all other NTPDases. We look at the ph phylogenetic analysis of this enzyme and uh, although you will see different names here, so we, we, we can see a cluster. There's a group where there is higher homology is the plasma membrane bound NTPDases. So all of these are NTPDases 1, 2, and 3, and with NTPDases 8. So they, they form a cluster with, with higher uh, homologies between each of them. Uh, this chicken uh, thing is, is, the, the homolo the, is the homolog of NTPDases 8. Obviously, it has the highest homology too. But uh, it's also uh, similar to NTPDAs 1, 2 here, and, and 3 here. So it's, uh, so it's this in the same family, obviously, as, as we were expecting. So we then I, uh, identified the measured, evaluated the biochemical characteristics of the mouse NTPDAs 8 that we had cloned at the time. I, we used the recombinant form. So we tested several para parameters or uh, biochemical characteristics of the enzyme, like the enzyme can hydrolyze ATP and ADP uh, linearly over time for about 40 minutes. It, it works we very well in the physiological uh, range. It has other NTPDAs and ectocleotidase that require divalent cations for activity, either calcium and or magnesium. And this enzyme can hydrolyze very well all P2 receptors agonists uh, at least most of them uh, here is ATP, UTP, ADP, and UTP are all very well hydrolyzed by this enzyme. So we also evaluated KM and the max of the enzyme. And we then compared the biochemical activity of this enzyme compared to what was known already. So NTPD is one and two. In fact, none of this was all known, but these genes were cloned before, obviously. Uh, I'm not talking about NTPDS4, 5, 6, and 7, which are mainly inside the, the cells, associated with the uh, membranes inside the cells. So, so I'm, we are interested in the lab about these plasma membrane-bound NTPDAs. So as you can see here, all of these enzymes hydrolyze very well ATP. So we put ATP, all of these enzymes, NTPDAs 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 8, hydrolyze ATP, sorry, hydrolyze ATP very well. And NTPDAs1 hydrolyze ADP as soon as it is produced. So it doesn't lead to much accumulation of ADP and a very fast accumulation of AMP with NTPDAs1. With NTPDAs2, it doesn't, it hydrolyzes ATP very well, but not doesn't hydrolyze ADP very well. It's, it's very bad substrate for, for NTPDAs2. And what we see is an accumulation of ADP. And the AMP is produced very, very slowly. 
and NTPDH3 and 8 are somehow in between these two activities. So what is interesting here is that this can lead to different type of, of biological activation by P2 and P1 receptors. For example, NTPDAs1 by generating very rapidly AMP, the substrate of five prime nucleotidase, can lead to a lot of adenosine very fast. But more than that, NTPDAs1 by hydrolyzing very well ATP and ADP, remove the inhibitor of five prime nucleotidase because these these two molecules, ATP and ADP, are inhibitors of 5 prime nucleotidase. So that means that here we not only have a lot of substrate very fast, but in the same time, we remove all the inhibitors of uh, 5 prime nucleotidase. So we can lead to a very fast production of adenosine. While this is certainly not the case with NTPDase 2 because we, have, we don't have a lot of substrate and we have a lot of uh, very potent inhibitor of 5 prime nucleotidase. So adenosine here will be uh, delayed very, very much uh, if it can still occur. And again, with NTPDase 2 and 8, we have some something in between that. So of course, our focus today is on NTPDase 8. With UTP, we, I will just resume this, that with UTP, we see very similar uh, hydrolysis profile. So a UTP is as good substrate as ATP. So it's hydrolyzed very well by all of these enzymes. But UDP is not uh, the best substrate for all of these enzymes. So UDP accumulates uh, a little bit in the medium before uh, it, it goes. So uh, this may be the, 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 minor, uh, the, the slight modification about that. But UTP is as good substrate as ATP. So what I want you to remember from this uh, from this part is that we have identified the fourth plasma membrane bound in TPDAs. It's, uh, it's in the same group of enzyme, and this is the last member of the ENTPDAs family. So, so now what's about is function. So to help to know what is the function of NTPDAs, eight obviously it helps to know where it is located. So this is one obviously one of the things we did at first. So we look at the expression of the mRNA in mouse tissues. And as expected, we found high level in liver, in kidney, and in the intestine. We saw a good expression in the intestine. We repeated this result with an antibody that we, we added at the time against porcine tissues, against porcine and TPDAs 8. And we found the same uh, result as we found in mouse with the mRNA expression, but at the protein level with pig tissues. So again, a uh, high expression in the liver and also in the intestine. So we use antibodies, again, that we produce in the lab. And uh, as you can see here, this is a section of intestine. And here we have the lumen of the intestine. And we can see a strong labeling with this brown deposit all around on the apical surface of the epithelial cells. So it's not expressed anywhere else in the in the intestine, but at the apical surface, facing the lumen, facing the microbiota, or facing whatever you can think of here. So we then to know more about this enzyme and to look at its function, we generated knockout mice for NTPDS8, so and mouse deficient in NTPDS8. So just to confirm that. Uh, these mice here uh, do not express the gene of NTPDase 8. They do obviously don't express the mRNA in the colon of the gene compared to control. And they also don't express the protein. So this is just to confirm that the knockout mice that we did were really knockout for NTPDase 8. And then we use these knockout mice, knockout tissues, intestine. We use Y-type intestine above. And below, we tested NTPDase 8 deficient intestines below and we tested the activity with ATP. As you can see in both wild type and knockout mice we see a lot of activity, ATPase activity. And I, but I would like to draw your attention to this staining here that is enlarged and this here. So this is the lumen again and you see an ATPase activity at the apical surface of these intestinal epithelial cells that correlate with the antibody staining that I just showed uh, in the previous slide. So this activity that we see on the apical surface of epithelial cells is totally absent in the knockout mice. So that confirms the result we have seen uh, so far. 
we obtain very similar results with ADP. And to have a more precise evaluation of the activity, we clamp the intestine and measure biochemical activity, biochemical ATPase activity inside the intestine. And compared to the wild type mice, we see a reduction of ATPase activity, not complete, but a big reduction of ATPase activity. And we repeated this experiment with primary epithelial cell culture. And uh, with this in vitro experiment with these cells, we confirm exactly the same thing, a reduction in ATPase activity, but also a reduction in ADPAs, UTPAs, and UDPAs activities. So confirming the result we have found so far. So as if what I want you to remember for this part is that an, although NTPDAS8 is a very minor nucleotidase in the whole intestine, it is responsible for the hydrolysis of nucleotides at the apical surface of the intestine. So this is a, in total amount of ATPase activity is very, it's minimal, it's, it's very small, but uh, at, in the lumen of the intestine, this is, the, this is the, the key player that makes the, whole, the main difference here. So now what about the function of NTPDase 8? So uh, you will see me coming, I guess, I hope so. So if you remember, in the first, uh, at the beginning, I mentioned that ATP and nucleotides were, uh, and UTP, UDP were uh, pro-inflammatory. And having an enzyme, NTPDase 8, having an enzyme that hydrolyzed these pro-inflammatory molecules uh, would certainly favor to have, uh, to protect from inflammation, especially that we would produce adenosine to, uh, to change a pro-inflammatory factor into an, uh, molecules with anti-inflammatory properties. So this is the hypothesis that we tested, and we tested that with the knockout mice. So we tested that indirectly with the knockout mice. So we used a, a, a colitis model. The model is to, in, uh, to put dextran sodium sulfate, DSS, I will say DSS in this, uh, in this talk from now, uh, putting DSS in the drinking water uh, to mice for seven days. We evaluated the disease activity index for seven days. Uh, the disease activity index was measured as uh, points, a series of points co uh, corresponding to weight loss, diarrhea, and blood in the feces. Uh, if you put DSS to mice, normal mice, wild type mice, we can see that these mice become very sick after seven days. They become very sick. Obviously, if we give water to NTPDS8 knockout mice or to white type mice, they don't develop any disease. But as you can see, the mice that do not have NTPDS8 are really very, very sick. The disease like activity level is very high. So what does this mean? It means that during inflammation of the intestine, the intestine would release endogenous nucleotides and with these nucleotides, you would have a very potent inflammation. That's how we can explain this. And having the enzyme can bring back to a lower level of inflammation, as we can see here, lower level of the disease. And this was confirmed with uh, uh, histopathology, where we compared white type pieces of the, of the colon here with knockout tissues. Here, so without the SS, both white type and knockout, this show a very nice structure of epithelium, and uh, all the structure is very well uh, preserved. I mean, this is a normal mice, but when you do the SS, all these mice have a sign of of uh, epithelial cell erosion, and uh, I don't even know see where it is. So we have epithelial cell erosion, and we have infiltration of inflammatory cells in all of them, but this is much more apparent in the knockout mice uh, uh, in agreement with the result we have found above here with the disease activity index. So we measured other parameters of inflammation. The colon length is a very nice indication of inflammation of the intestine. Uh, when there is inflammation, the colon shrinks. Uh, so a normal colon would have about seven centimeter in wild type in, in, uh, in normal conditions, so both uh, the white type and the knockout mice. But when under DSS treatment, after seven days, the colon is, is shrinking for the white type and much more for the deficient mice, NTPDSI deficient mice. We also observed that the integrity of the epithelium was damaged 
much more in the knockout mice than the wild type mice after DSS treatment. Uh, to have, a, uh, to have um, uh, an epithelium that is uh, that, that that the integrity is compromised uh, is very bad for for the for the health of the animal. Not only for colitis, but it can lead to 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 other disease. But it's obviously very bad for for colitis to have uh, permeability in the intestine, like we see here, and. Uh, we also evaluated the macrophage number with the F4AD marker. And again, we also have more of these macrophage inflammatory cells inside the intestine of the knockout mice. And we also had dramatically more neutrophils uh, as evaluated with myelo peroxidase activity. So we have a dramatic uh, increase of these inflammatory cells in the knockout mice. So we also evaluated the mucus secretion of, from coffer cells, as we can see here. So after DSS treatment, we see much less of this staining in the, in the knockout mice. And this is also bad because the mucus is a protection of the intestine. So if you don't have the mucus, uh, it's another protection that the intestine doesn't have. So this is uh, the, re the result that were quantified. So there is less mucus producing cells, less mucus cells in the knockout mice, which is also bad. And we also evaluated uh, apoptosis in these mice and apoptosis is, is increased in the knockout mice compared to white type after the DSS treatment. So again, this is a, another sign that the intestine are not doing well at all in the knockout mice. So we have evaluated the expression level of the cytokines, of pro-inflammatory cytokines. I'm just showing a few of them here, but in general, most of the pro-inflammatory cytokine measured were uh, compared to the, what, the, 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 the mice that did not receive DSS. Uh, they have a lot of, of uh, expression of KC and MIP2, for example, uh, much more than in the white type mice. And MIP KC and MIP2 are chemokines for that attracts neutrophils. So this could explain why we had more neutrophils, uh, why we had more myelo peroxidase uh, in, the, in the intestine of the knockout mice. And MCP1 attracts monocytes. So this could be the reason why we had more monocytes uh, in these intestines and uh, a similar result with many other chemokines. So what's the conclusion of this part is that in the absence of NTPDase 8, mice show exacerbated inflammation in the DSS model of colitis. Uh, but how does it do that? How NTPDase 8 can protect the intestine from inflammation? So again, I guess you are seeing me coming that and at the beginning, we mentioned that the role of this enzyme is to control the level of the agonist level of the P2 receptors and P1 receptors. So this is what we look. We look at the P2 express. The P2Y receptors express in intestinal epithelial cells. And uh, hopefully there is no compens compensation mechanism in the knockout mice because as the wild type mice, they show similar level of, uh, of these P2 re receptors. And as you can see, P2Y6 is the dominant P2Y receptors. Uh, we have several evidence in the lab and from other laboratories that uh, P2Y6 as well as P2Y2 is generally pro-inflammatory. So that's not surprising to, to see that here. We also have high level of P2Y1, but this, is, uh, this was rather found to be involved in the reflex control of the intestine. So we did not uh, look at this. But we look, we first look at the mouse at the dominant P2Y receptors expressed in the intestine and look if it was uh, the player here, why uh, NTPDase 8 uh, are protecting the, these, uh, these mice. So, it, so we evaluated if it would be because it hydrolyzed the agonists of P2Y6. So this is what we did with bone marrow transplantation studies. We did bone marrow transplantation because P2Y6 is expressed on both leukocytes and also on non hematopoietic cells, so intestinal epithelial cells, so it's on both. So this is why we did bone marrow transplantation to discriminate both of these effects. And to make a long story short, if we do the DSS model, here we have the, all the control mice of all these mice uh, with water, so they don't develop the disease. But as you can see here, all transplanted mice from wild type knockout to knockout, wild type to knockout, knockout to wild type, and all of this control, we see lots of in, uh, disease, lots of colitis 
in all of these mice except the mice that do not have P2Y6 on the epithelial cells. So without P2Y6, the, the mice, they don't, they don't develop colitis at all. So this is uh, uh, very important uh, data to potentially explain why we, you know, NTPDS8 is doing these effects. So we measured other parameters of inflammation. And as you can see here, in agreement with what we found with the level of colitis in these mice, the colon length of the mice that do not have P2Y6 in the epithelium is normal compared to all control mice, while the, the, other, com the other mice did, uh, were shortened. And the myeloperoxidase activity is, is almost absent in these mice when P2Y6 is not in the epithelial cell. So again, in agreement with all the information that we found about colitis. And if we look at the DSS treated mice here, compared to the non-treated mice with no DSS, with no DSS, we can see nice epithelial cell structure everywhere. But all these mice after DSS, they will see er erosion and, and immune cells infiltration in all of these uh, control mice, except the epithelium that do not have P2Y6. This epithelium is very nice. Sorry. This this epithelium is very nicely preserved, as if it never saw DSS. So, like like it was in the almost as nice as it was without uh, in the control in the control with uh, no DSS. So again, showing the same type of results. So here, uh, with just that we evaluated pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, we have, uh, we evaluated much more than that, but just to to show that it follows uh, what we have found so far. So it looks like NTPDAS8 is protecting uh, the, the intestine by hydrolyzing the, the nucleotides released, the agonists of P2Y6. So what we did here is to our knockout mice, we treated with DSS. We injected ent uh, uh, um, intrarectally an antagonist of P2Y6. So with a dose-dependent manner, in a dose-dependent manner, the knockout mice, which are very sick, sick uh, are protected with, in a dose-dependent uh, manner with P2Y6 antagonists. So uh, explaining why we have, uh, as expected, so P2Y6 is involved in these mice uh, for the disease that we see. And we tested the intestinal permeability and uh, the same compared to if we have uh, mice that uh, do not have DSS, they are fine. Uh, the integrity of the epithelium is compromised here and there is permeability. So the FTC dextran goes from the, from the, from the intestine uh, that was taken by oral uh, gavage and is going directly to the plasma. So that's very bad. But in a dose dependent manner, we can reverse that as well. So, uh, so not only the disease, but obviously the permeability is, uh, is going with the disease and is very bad to, to have a permeable intestine, as I mentioned earlier. So then inflammation in NTPDAS8 deficient mice can be reverted by a P2Y6 antagonist or if we block P2Y6. But can we do the same thing in wild type mice? Obviously, the answer looks like yes, because we already did it with bone marrow transplantation studies. But here we tried it. The same experiment we did with knockout mice were repeated with wild type mice. So again, uh, a wild type mice that has DSS develop, the, develop colitis. And again, I did not mention it earlier, but again, the antagonist was taken daily and, and correctly starting from day two. So when the disease started, we started to put the antagonist of P2Y6, and we observe exactly the same results with uh, protection of colitis with, in a dose-dependent manner with the P2Y6 antagonist compared to the white type without an, any antagonist. And we see the same thing with uh, the permeability as we saw in the knockout mice, antibodies at knockout mice. So what we have tested here is we use apirase. Apirase is a commercially uh, available enzyme that has NTPDAS8-like activities. 
So we use that for the only reason that it's easier to uh, it's it's easier to to use. And we also injected it daily from day two. And this is one of the astonishing work uh, data that I promised you from the beginning is that apirates do not only reduce inflammation in a wild type mice. This, these are wild type mice. This is not knockout mice. So apirates can totally revert the inflammation. There is absolutely no colitis at all, at all when these mice are treated with an enzyme that hydrolyzes nucleotides inside the intestine. We see the same thing with the intestinal permeability. So that, that's 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 really uh, it's really nice. So so uh, it, it's very nice for a mice to know that uh, I can treat a mice for colitis. But uh, I'm sure the mice are very glad to know that. But uh, can we also use this pathway in IBD patients? Can 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 we do we have the same mechanism in mice in uh, in human? Uh, and obviously, this could lead to a potential treatment for for IBD. And what we did, we did a few experiments. So we, in collaboration with uh, with surgeon at the hospital, we um, I just realized that I forgot to invite them. That's very bad uh, to my presentation. Uh, with, an, with another antibody, because most of our antibodies are species specific, so we have antibodies for human and TPDS8, and we can see a nice staining in the crypts uh, of the intestine. And uh, don't be confused, the crypts is, is, uh, is exactly the same staining we got in mice, uh, so this is in human. Uh, these structures, when they, they go to the, the crypts, when they are at the membrane, this goes to the lumen. So this is exactly the same thing that we observe in the luminal surface. So this is the apical surface of the epithelium uh, that will face the lumen when this uh, structure uh, comes to the outside of the, the intestine. So we have exactly the same presence and same localization of NTPDS8 in the human intestine. So we did culture of, of these human cells, of intestinal uh, epithelial cells. Um, and uh, this is just controls to make sure that our epithelium is not normally differentiated and that it's working very well. And we look at the expression, uh, mRNA expression by qPCR, and we found NTPDS8 expressed in this epithelium, in the epithelial cell, as well as ectofibronucleotidase. And we see also exactly the same pat pro pattern profile for the P2Y receptor uh, expression. So P2Y6 in human is also dominant and P2Y1 uh, express uh, exactly as in, in uh, mice, uh, we have P2Y2 and, and we have a little bit of P2Y4 that may be involved uh, in human too, possibly. So we did some more experiment with, uh, with uh, this epithelium from human. And uh, it was not easy to find people that wanted to drink DSS and to be analyzed like this. So what we can do, we can mimic we can mimic an inflammation of, in these cells by stimulating these cells with TNF and LPS. So when we stimulate these cells with TNF and LPS, we, uh, the uh, integrity of the epithelial cells is compromised. So we have permeability that can be evaluated again with FITC dextran, but this is in cell culture uh, in, both, uh, in both in chambers. So we can see that the integrity is compromised, but if we do, if we stimulate these cells, all of these cells were stimulated with uh, TNF and LPS. So in presence of an antagonist of P2Y6, the permeability is, 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 is much better. It's, it's, uh, the integrity is, is uh, well preserved. In presence of an enzyme that hydrolyzes nucleotides, it's even better. We also tested uh, antagonists of P2Y1. There is uh, no effect at all. Sorry, I don't have the result here, but the, there is no effects of P2Y1 antagonist. Uh, but a P2Y2 antagonist, we were expecting that also because I did not show it, but P2Y2 uh, in mouse was also involved. We found that it was also involved in uh, inflammation of the, of the intestine. Uh, if we use an antagonist of P2Y2, it also protects a little bit slightly the uh, 
the integrity of the epithelium. And this is probably why apirase is working so well, because when you hydrolyze nucleotides, you not only hydrolyze P2Y6 agonists, but you also hydrolyze P2Y2 agonists. So this is probably why it's working so well when you, we use an enzyme that hydrolyzes nucleotides. We have also, these are preliminary data, but we have also evaluated IL-8 secretion. IL-8 is a chemokine involved in the inflammation of uh, several tissues, which attracts neutrophils. And uh, we tested the same system with IL-8 expression. If, and if we mimic inflammation again of the, uh, of the human epithelial cells, we see expression of IL-8 and a reduction with P2Y6 antagonists as well as with P2Y2 antagonists. And again, apparase is working much better. So does this mean that we can use this pathway as a treatment for inflammatory bowel disease in, 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 in humans. So this is obviously the, the, the where we are going now. Uh, should we use a P2Y6 antagonist or NTPD8 protein that would have activity in the, that we could do as a soluble enzyme? So with P2Y6, we believe that we could, uh, we could, could work really well. Uh, especially with the result that we obtained, uh, that I showed you, especially with the bone marrow transplant, where it could block totally the inflammation just by uh, removing P2Y6 as a player here. But NTPDase 8 might have uh, several advantages over P2Y6 because it hydrolyzes endogenous release nucleotide directly during inflammation. It hydrolyzes not only the agonist of P2Y6, but also the agonist of another pro-inflammatory receptor also present there, P2Y2. And uh, some Brazilian guys also found that P2X7 was involved in the inflammation in colitis. Uh, so NTPDS8 would also hydrolyze the agonist of P2X7. So it could be it could block inflammation by doing blocking three pro-inflammatory receptors in the intestine. But more than that. It also helped with I5 pancreatitis. It also helped generate adenosine that uh, should have some further beneficial effects. But this was not proven in our uh, result. We did not see a, a clear in, uh, involvement of any clear involvement of adenosine receptors. But uh, this is certainly not bad to have adenosine instead of uh, nucleotides uh, in the area. So, uh, so this is our focus at the moment. So as a final summary, what is the take home message? What I would like you to remember is that we identified uh, the last member of the NTPDase family. This is NTPDase 8. This enzyme is responsible for the hydrolysis of nucleotides inside the intestine, and it protects inflammation by blocking P2Y6 activation, mainly by blocking P2Y6 activation. And we also found that blocking P2Y6 activation alone protects the inflammation in wild type mice. So the future direction, as you, you saw, is, is, uh, is to further prove and uh, document this if this can be used as a, in clinical uh, application. But uh, as a scientist, it looks like we are close, but uh, there's still a lot to do to, to convince and to do all the steps that is, are now needed to, to, to go one step further. So who did, who did the job? So Francois Biganes a while ago cloned the mouse NTPDase 8, the first NTPDase 8, uh, which was characterized by Sébastien Levesque and Philip Kukulski. Uh, Ioana then cloned the rat and the human form of NTPDase 8. Michel characterized them, uh, characterized the enzyme in the liver and uh, worked a lot of uh, similar work as that we did here. He, he did that with the liver and documented that. Uh, Alain did the knockout mice, and uh, Julie generated all the antibodies that we use in this uh, in this work. Um, she was also involved, Julie uh, was also involved in uh, every step, uh, always a help for, for all the lab all the time for this project as well. And Mabruka made the uh, terrific work, amount of work, uh, about all the intestine work that I presented today in both mouse and human. So this this was all done. This is all the work of uh, Mabruka. Uh, I don't know if you can see some people in the group, but you, you might see some friends and, and colleagues here. So we have three Brazilian guys that were uh, in training at, in my lab at the time. This was after Elisandra's coming to, to my lab. 
uh, Matthias Bastos, if you know him, there is Lucas Passo, there is Andrea Macado Cardozo here that you probably know as well. So, uh, so it was always a chance to have them to, to help us with uh, several projects. Of course, this work would not be possible with the help of collaborators and some support. Uh, Dr. Luc Vallière teached us how to do the bone marrow transplant studies and uh, we use his equipment to, for the irradiation and all of this. Uh, Dr. Robert gave us the P2Y6 knockout mice and is always very helpful to, uh, to help, help us with the with ideas and, and writing papers and all of this. Uh, so I'll, I'll, another very nice help uh, from there. Um, and yes, that's it. So if I don't show the, 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 the group photo of 2020, uh, this is just because we were too far away on the picture. So that's why I showed the one of 2019. So again, you can see some some people from Brazil that were that I had the chance to have in the lab last year, uh, very recently. So Walmer, Juliana, and Daniela, that you, I'm sure you know. Um, so thank you. So if there is any question, are you still there? I feel that I'm talking myself since an hour in my office. So just... No, no. <laughs> Here's someone. Yes, yes. Great, great talk, and the people were very. Uh, 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 your your the, the people really like you you know because although we we are we for technical problems we have the delay but people are still there in YouTube and they Good. made a lot of questions a lot of questions uh, I know you, yes 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 yes. Uh, and then there are a lot of uh, congratulations and people really, really enjoy your, oh, your, for... your seminar. And I really enjoy it. It's a beautiful work, very elegant tools that you, you have done to, to, to prove the, the participation of P2X, P2I6 in the inflammatory bowel disease. It's a very nice, very nice paper. And I crossing my finger that that you succeed with the publication that you told me in the weekend. The work is very yeah, nice. It's uh, on the way, accepted with minor revision, so in gut, so waiting for the final uh, final answer. Yeah, yeah. So I have some questions, but the, the first question uh, was made from was made by Christina Firstenau. She's with us. Very nice to see all the people that was in your lab. Christina was with me when I was doing the PhD. Christina, Christina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, Christina. <laughs> uh, uh, she wrote, thank you for the very nice talk, Je. I have some questions about your beautiful work. Firstly, I would like to know if you also check it for the contribution of P2I2 and DSS model. DSS model P2I2 are, are sensitive to, they are very sensitive to. Okay. So, but uh, we'd never tried to block it alone, else than with apirase. But this is probably why apirase is working so well. It's uh, certainly because it's it's uh, it's hydrolyzing. Uh, but in mice, we did P2. Robert gave us uh, Bernard Robert gave us the P2I2 mice knockout mice as well. And uh, wow. so it, it was, uh, they were very uh, sensitive to the SS colitis. And then uh, the, uh, she I mean, continued. I mean, protected the other way around with the, uh, with the knock, but it, it, it fits with the, I mean, it fits with, with our hypothesis that P2Y2 was pro inflammatory as well. Ah, okay, okay. So she continued. Uh, also, the result about soluble apparatus. Apirase blocking colitis development in white type mice is really amazing. I agree with her. Uh, could you say something about using its clinically effective to compromising other signaling pathways modulated by nucleotides? Thank you again. Good to see you. If it could be used in other model of inflammation, yes, of course. No, in, the, can even... in the clinician. She uh, she's referring to using the in, in the in the patients the upper rays or 
with IBD or with some some other uh, disease? Uh, with in colitis. The IBD. Right. About IBD, this is what we want to what we want to test. Um, I mean, someone that suffers from IBD, uh, I think it would be. Uh, uh, I, I mean, it's not. We cannot. We are not allowed to inject, of course, a drug against P2Y6, but to inject um, might not be very uh, fun. But I mean, somebody that suffers from uh, from colitis for for a long time and probably uh, Crohn disease as well. Uh, I, I think that I see. I don't see anything. But we need to, to do a device that we could take orally that could target to the intestine. But at the moment, I would see no problem to inject a protein uh, intrarectally if it could. But uh, of course, this is not something we can do uh, like this. But I, I would not see any uh, any problem for health. Of course, with an antagonist, uh, there's lots of tests to be done. Uh, but for the enzyme, it's. Uh, but anyway, this is not something I'm allowed to do. This is not something we could do uh, now. So we, there's many steps to try to, to go this way. But we we protected this with a with a patent. So this is. A, but if it's related to other disease, this can of course uh, uh, could help decrease inflammation. And I mean, any any inflammation uh, system that you think a pyre should always change pro-inflammatory molecules into adenosine. So it needs to be tested, but of course it could work in so many. Uh, but the intestine is that we have easily access to it. So this is something we can easily access. So when I think about arthritis or to inject the, an enzyme like in the, in the joint, or this is not something uh, very easy to do. Uh, so even to test, it's not, uh, it's not that easy. For thrombosis, it worked superbly, I mean, now they are a team that develop a, a soluble form of another NTPDAs. Uh, I mean, it, it, you remove the plated, plated aggregation agonists and you add an NC a plated aggregate uh, a compound with NC aggregatory properties in adenosine. But during uh, thrombosis and all these things, you have inflammation, so you protect from inflammation. So this should really work much better than the P2Y12 antagonist that is at, uh, presently uh, Use like cyclopidine, clopidogrel, and the new form of PTY12 antagonist. Uh, this this is certainly something that would work so well. But uh, the, uh, make a to make a soluble form of this enzyme is not something uh, I realize it's not something easy. And uh, Juliana, that you see on the picture here, uh, she help with, she's helping us with this. And uh, it's not that easy because otherwise we would have already succeeded. So we have to work a, a bit more with. Uh, with the protein to be able to develop, uh, because uh, no company would, uh, would 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 help us to to use uh, something like a pyrase, for example. Uh, there's no company com no company that would help us to 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 work on this. So we really need to have the soluble form of this enzyme. So that's why we are working on it. I don't know if it answered the question. If it was more about about IBD or a disease, but anyway, I covered much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was okay. Hoping that so, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Some answer to that question. We have a we have an, uh, another question from our professor Marcia Vink. Yes, hello, Marcia. Our yeah, our friend too. Je, uh, very be uh, very be very beautiful data. Congrats. How about the expression of NTPDs eight and P two I six in the intestine of patients with? intestine inflam inflammation disease is there any data analyzing biopsies uh we did not look at this uh, yet we are just so happy to have uh, some uh, pieces of the of this intestine but uh, it has been reported that p2y6 level were increased in i don't remember which type of colitis patient or but it was increased uh, but this might be confusing because the inflammatory cells also express P2Y6. So I don't think uh, anything, I, as far as I remember, I don't think anything was done specifically on the epithelium. So, uh, of course, if you have an increase on inflammatory cells, P2Y6 could also develop uh, inflammation there. And this is another paper uh, that I, I started in Simon's Robson Labs that has been published with NTPDAs1. So if those that knows this paper, they, they found uh, the inflammation was not 
as strong as in, with NTPDS8 knockout mice, but the NTPDS1 were also very sensitive to the DSS colitis model. And, uh, but NTPDS1 is present on blood cells, so it's protecting the inflammation at a totally different site. And NTPDS1 was also very sensitive, knockout mice were also very sensitive. And this may reflex maybe also P2Y6 expression, but in leukocytes. More. So I'm, I don't know if I'm confusing you, but but yes, in patient, P2Y6 was shown to be increased, but um, I don't think we, they, they could discriminate which type of cells. So they, in the tissue, there's some more of P2Y6, but it could well be a, a leukocyte, it could be well be the epithelium, so this is uh, something to work more. But uh, in any case, in our situation, so even if the P2Y6 or NTPDAs, I don't change much, or even if they changed they go up or they go they go down. What is obvious is that P2Y6, even if it goes up or even if it goes down, the inflammation is present and blocking P2Y6 works. And even if NTPDS8 is might be uh, activity might be reduced, but uh, acti even if the activity remains the same, it's not sufficient to protect the inflammation totally. So in any case, we need to provide more of we need to block more of these P2A receptors and we need to provide more of this enzymatic activity. So this is uh, this is probably why we did not pay too much attention on this yet. But to do a study like this, we need many, many patients. And uh, so far, we are just glad to have uh, to be able to have access to a patient once in a time, once a, uh, once in a while. So uh, but this is certainly worse that we want to do. But this is not something we could start yet. And we need many more uh, specimen for such analysis. Okay, okay. okay. It's a very okay. complex uh, uh, signaling. And then when we modulate one, your 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 data regarding P2X, P2I6 and P2X7 crosstalk in your experimental, uh, uh, experimental uh, situation uh, is very similar to the data that I got with glioblastoma cells. We saw the same, the same. When we block the P2I6, we also have a, an effect in the P2I, uh, P2X7 receptor. So I think that is a it's a very complex signaling pathway, and then you you have to 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 take care when we are modulating uh, and uh, the nucleotide that we are removing, they are agonists of the, the other receptors of the, 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 the this uh, signaling system. So we have to be careful uh, yes, in this order is why to, we, to, to we have the, the, good, the good effect. Yes, this is Sorry? why we did not only knock out mice, but we are using antagonists because, uh, but on the epithelial cell, this is not an issue. But I agree with you that I did not touch this aspect at all. But when P2Y6 is present, it modulates indeed. We Mabuka published a paper on that too in the lab. That uh, And uh, um, I wonder if your results were going that way with the BBA. But uh, anyway, it could. Uh, it was not that far. And some um, somebody in Montreal, uh, uh, Sigila, uh, Dr. Sigila, found the same, uh, another pathway with P2X4 that was involved. But this is probably why we have some uh, using the deficient mice in the in the blood cells. Uh, we see a different uh, opposite effects than what we were expecting. Mm -hmm. And P2Y6 is also pro-inflammatory in these cells. But this is probably uh, answered by what you just said that P2Y6 act, uh, modulate the signaling of other cells. But this is not a problem in the intestine. So this is not uh, by doing an antagonist, an intrarectal antagonist, or orally de delivered antagonist with uh, some devices. Uh, this, this, if as long as it doesn't doesn't go to the blood, uh, this is not a problem for us. But if okay. we do something like this in the blood uh, to treat some uh, other disease with P2Y6 antagonists in the long term, in the short term, it would work well, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure of it. It would work well, but in the long term, it will. It may lead to very uh, pr many problems, as you just mentioned. Okay, so I ha we have a, a last commentary for from Anna Anna Maria Batastini. She's also Hello, with Anna. us. <laughs> uh, dear Je, I was unable to attend the entire lecture, but it was a, gr a great pleasure to see you again. Thank you for sharing with us your excellent I did not have this pleasure from my side. 
<laughs> I hope I hope we can meet in person soon. Very yeah. nice. We too. Yeah, <laughs> so I think I I would like to thanks for your beautiful lecture to be here for your patience and uh, I hope to see you personally in maybe to uh, 2021 maybe in the next year maybe in the 2022 let's see what's happened with this pandemic but uh let's see but uh, i uh thank you very much for being here with us yeah a, a special thing from me for all the people that are still with us uh, at the moment so it was a uh, uh so but thank you so much for staying here all that time with all the the problems of connection we had yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank, thank you Jean. so i think that you have we we may pr proceed with the our next seminar and then i would like to 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 ask to professora cristina to introduce uh Dr. Tiago Borges. Thank you, Tiago, to be here. Thank you for your patience. Patience. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for everybody for sticking no with us. And uh, thank you, Tiago, for waiting. Thank you, Jean, for a wonderful talk. And uh, it was worth the wait. Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Tiago. Uh, for people who don't know Tiago, um, was my student since um, uh, undergrad. He was, uh, he graduated in biology by uh, Pucris and he did a master's in uh, cell biology, cellular molecular biology, also by Pucci in 2012. And then he did uh, his PhD in the same uh, graduate program in 2015. But for people uh, who don't just looks at these um, numbers, um, actually, I have to tell you that Tiago is probably my most prolific collaborator. I think we have some 20 papers together. It's like 25% of my scientific production is with Tiago. Um, Tiago was always very curious. He was an amazing student and clearly a lot better than his supervisor, clearly. He is uh, now, he's always um, so enthusiastic. He um, fostered the development of many students who are now postdocs or even uh, still graduate students of mine. And we keep actively collaborating and doing international collaborations. When he did his PhD and uh, it was a sandwich PhD and he, he managed to do two PhDs at the same time, I think, because he was at the same time at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard with Leo Riella doing the transplant part of his PhD. And also with Stuart Calderwood at the Beth Israel at Harvard doing a second part of his PhD, which summed to two PhDs at the same time, believe me. And um, afterwards, he came back to Brazil. He was a postdoc for a short time, and then he went back to Harvard and now he is um, he was then a, a fellow I think at the Brigham and Women's Hospital with Leo and he is now at the Massachusetts General Hospital all the way across town by the ocean uh, at the MGH starting his own research and uh, I'm very proud to introduce him today as you can see and he's going to talk to us about his most recent research on uh, cardiac transplantation and how the expression of PD-1 uh, induces tolerance. Welcome, Thiago. Thank you for waiting. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the kind words. I was the happy one to have as a mentor. Um, thank you, Liz, for the invitation, for the organization. The event is great with great speakers. And um, yeah, I'm a, a research fellow here at MGH. We are in a trans the Center for Transplantation Science. It's a very prestigious place that I'm very lucky to be here. Um, and today I'm gonna start with a brief introduction about uh, transplantation immunology. I don't know how much you guys know about it. So uh, before I dive into the data, I go briefly about 
this. And also, I'd like to say that everything I'm going to share today isn't published. It's in a revision, but it's still unpublished. So um, any feedback from you guys would be great. Um, so uh, to start with, so transplantation is done when your organ failures and you don't have anything else to do. So you have to replace that organ with a new organ or just implant a new organ in your body. And how does like a kidney transplant here in the example or any organ uh, transplant get rejected? So the organ comes with like a fingerprint uh, that's unique from each person. And unfortunately, the immune system is a barrier in order to that organ to uh, be accepted. So the same immune system that helps you to find to fight any infection that hopefully soon we're gonna, gonna help us to fight to protect uh, protect us against COVID um, uh, COVID nineteen. It also can be harmful to this transplant organ. So the immune system uh, recognizes in the donor organ a class of molecules that we call MHC. So the major histocompatibility complex. And in humans, that's called uh, the human leukocyte antigen. It's the same thing, just uh, different names. Um, so these molecules, they are essential for the present, presenting foreign peptides to the T cell. Um, and they are highly polymorphic, so they can they can be divided into classes. Class one, they are expressed by all nucleated cells, or class two, they are expressed on APCs, B cells. There are B cells, monocytes, and dendritic cells. We know in humans, at least class two can also sometimes be expressed by endothelial cells, uh, which makes the story more complicated. But basically. When you have a transplant, your immune system are able to recognize that these molecules are different. Your molecules are different from the donor. So actually, it's, it's end up activating the immune system and rejecting the organ. And um, I'm going to introduce to you guys how this uh, kind of work briefly. So we kind of classify rejection. It's not very accurate and good, good. it could um, varies, but we kind of classify that in two different uh, types. Um, the hyper, uh, hyperacute rejection, it occur, it's very rare these days, occur minutes to hours after the transplant. Actually, you have preformed antibodies uh, to the donor. We do, nowadays, we do a several, a lot of testing to make sure that doesn't happen. And actually what happens is like, uh, you have this act, um, activative complement system and um, you have a uh, thrombosis and graft loss. Um, the acute rejection, it occurs weeks to months after the transplant. And actually it's, um, I hope you guys are seeing my cursor. Uh, it's um, mediated by lymph uh, lymphocyte infiltration and tissue damage. And actually, this is the one that I'm going to focus the, my talk today, the acute rejection and the mechanisms. And the chronic rejection um, occurs later on time, months to years after transplant, and involves graft fibrosis, arteriopathy, leading to uh, deterioration and function of the organ. And um, mechanisms are the mechanisms underlying this type of rejection are still unclear. And also this is a, this is a focus of our lab now as these days is done by another Brazilian postdoc that's here, Rodrigo, and he's focused in this part um, of the research. So this guy is the T cell. So our immune system has one of the cell types are the T cells. And these guys are essential for this rejection um, response. So if you have, if you grab a mouse, we have we have an animal that doesn't have any T cells. So and you do a transplant on these animals, these animals are unable to reject the allograft. So these T cells are like the major player here, um, in at least in the cellular rejection. So. Our, 
they are the these are the T cells that they will recognize this allopeptides or the allo antigen, right? So the T cells are able to see, okay, this this is a not this is not HLA from my body. So this is something weird. I should just um, reject this organ. And to do that, actually, the T cell needs to be activated by another um, subset of immune cell that's called endurotic cells. And this happens in uh, organs in, inside of our body that we call lymph nodes. So lymph node is a very special microenvironment that this um, intercount between dendritic cells and uh, the T cells will occur. And it's basically like a, a love story with a lot of passion. So they, um, they interact very closely uh, and very strongly in a, uh, in a phenomenon that we call immunological synapses uh, or synapse. So, uh, and this, when this interaction happens, what's happening actually in the dendritic cell, so this is Christina's favorite slide ever. So if you ever work in her lab, you should know this slide from day one, I would say from minute one. So um, when this love story is happening is, um, when the dendritic cell is giving three signals to the T cell in order to the T cell to be activated. Uh, so signal one, um, we call, that's the antigen specific, uh, specificity. So the TCR or the T cell receptor recognize the peptide complex in the MHC molecule. So the signal two, um, we say that's about the context and gonna be the co-stimulation. So just signal one is not sufficient to fully activate the T cell. So you also need signal two in order that to happen. And then this is called uh, co-stimulation and we get in more details uh, later on. And signal three is gonna kind of shape the type of T cell response that you have. So depending on how your the dendritic cell was initially activated, it will be producing um, types of cytokines that will shape the type of T cell response that you're gonna uh, perform later on. So, and then this is the signal tree. And in transplantation, we have um, actually three very special ways that this happened and three very special ways that the T cell we recognize the allo uh, antigen, and then we call uh, allo recognition pathways. So there is the, the first, and the, which happens early on, minutes after you do your transplantation, is the direct uh, pathway. So in the direct pathway, you have the donor uh, dendritic cells or the donor antigen presenting cells or APCs, as here, as you can see here in the slides. And the T cell will um, recognize the unprocessed donor MHC in the donor APC, right? So the donor cell interact directly with the host T cell. And if you ever read an immunology textbook, you see that okay, the T cells that are that are not specific to the self HLA, they are depleted. So how come? they can uh, recognize donor um, MHC. And the answer, we still don't know that yet, but that happens. And this response is very strong. Um, there is a second way that you can, um, that happens um, later after, so after the transplant, your donor cells, at least the immune cells start to die um, because they are killed by um, other immune cells from the host, but then what you have, you have the um, host antigen presenting cells acquiring these donor antigens, processing it, and uh, presenting these donor peptides in the host MHC. So the T cell here, um, it's um, doing, it's recognizing the donor antigens in a host MHC on a host APC. And recently, um, actually, it was published that a third type of uh, allo recognition pathway, that's something 
very interesting that's called the semi-direct pathway or uh, we can call cross-dressing. And why it's called cross-dressing? So um, researchers found that, uh, including one here at the MGH, um, they found that the donor APCs actually they produce a lot of exosomes. So I'm glad that um, Antonio spoke yesterday before me. So he did a very nice introduction about the vesicles, extracellular vesicles and exosomes. And these donor APCs produce these exosomes with donor MHCs. And instead of the host, um, host antigen presenting cells acquire and internalize the receptor. Actually, these, these exosomes, actually these exosomes can be um, incorporated in the host membrane in a phenomenon that we call cross-dressing. So we have this incorporation of the donor vesicles in the host cell, and then the molecule, the MHC of the donor MHC being tacked in the membrane. So it's kind of like host dendritic cells acquire pieces, full pieces of the donor cell and put it in, in the membrane and display it to the host T cell. And we call that the cross-dressing. And that's also very important uh, in this process. So as I told you, um, so on, not the, the recognition of the, the complex MHC and peptide is not sufficient to activate the T cell by the TCR. So we need a second signal, signal two, right? And the signal two, they can be either co-stimulatory co or activatory, gonna induce an inflammation, an inflammatory response and a factor response, or the signal, the signal can be co-inhibitory, meaning that it's gonna, um, it's gonna signal to the cell to chill okay, stop responding or respond less or don't respond at all. So it really depends on the context. Um, and this will affect how the T cell will produce the uh, its cytokines, how it proliferate after that and how it will survive as well. So as you can imagine, if the problem in rejection is to activate a lot of our T cells and reject the organ, so a lot of research in transplantation is done in the pathways that are co-inhibitory, which uh, are giving signals to inhibit this T cell response. And once the T cell sees signal one, signal two, so the signal three, uh, three is, gonna is gonna shape the type of the CD4, uh, the, the, the T cell response. Here I'm, I'm showing you um, how the CD4 T cells can uh, acquire different phenotypes after activation by APCs. We call that T cell flavor. So they can become TH1, TH17, TFH, TH2, and Tregs, and they will do, uh, and they have different functions according to whatever your body needs. For example, if you have an infection, you're, you're gonna respond in a way doing, um, let's say if you have, Viral infection is going to do a lot of TFH that is going to induce B cells to produce antibody. Um, that's what we aim when you do a vaccine, and that's um, what people are studying now in COVID, for example. So in transplantation, we have a lot of activation of these TH1 cells, which are, um, we're going to show you how they work, but they were the main, play, main players in rejecting the organ. So we are trying, we always trying to like stop them or, um, make them um, make them their numbers lower and less effective. And also there is a lot of research in those, the Tregs. So the Tregs, they're the other way around. They are uh, uh, anti-inflammatory cells. They're kind of our natural anti-inflammatory uh, anti um, medicine, let's say like that. So these cells, um, uh, I'll talk a lot of, about them today. So these cells, they are unique. They express this marker that's called FOXP3, it's a transcription factor that kind of regulates their function. And they are very special because they are able to um, inhibit either the other T cell responses, uh, as you can see here, or they can uh, also inhibit the dendritic cells, the macrophages, and any other potential cell in your um, uh, immune cell in your body. 
right? So they can do that for, for different mechanisms. I'm not going to dive into that today, but um, uh, importantly for the talk today, they express a lot of these co-inhibitory receptors as well. And they are, this is one of the way they, they can um, inhibit the factor response um, uh, different ways to producing anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10 and TGF-beta. So once your response is mounted and your Tregs are not sufficient to block this effector response or this rejection response, so we have these two types of effector response that are going to end up um, rejecting and destroying your transplant organ. So uh, one of one type of response, it's CD4 mediated. Actually, the CD4 T cells after they leave, so they are activating the, um, the lymph node, and after they, they 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 are activated, they kind of travel through the body looking for the antigen, and the, in this case, the antigen will be in the graft that you just received, and these cells once they um, find this graph, they leave the circulation, they go to the tissue and they will start to produce interferon gamma. This interferon gamma, uh, gamma are done by the Th1 subsets of uh, CD4 T cells. And these will lead to the recruitment of uh, other um, cells of the immune system that we call the innate cells. It's a different arm of the immune system. And these macrophages and other cells will kind of amplify this inflammation that will lead to the graft destruction. Um, but, at the, but the main cells that are going to do the destructions um, besides the CD4, cell, CD4 T cells are the CD8 T cells. And the CD8 T cells are called cytotoxic uh, because they are able to produce molecules that induce the target cell or the cell they recognize to die, right? So this is good if you have an, infa uh, uh, an infection again or a tumor, because as um, as Enfu showed yesterday, um, these cells can recognize tumor and kill these tumors. But once you have a transplant, that's not great because it will end up um, destroying your organ, transplant organ. So the way these CD8s do, do that, they uh, they produce a lot of periphery and granzyme B. They're molecules that signal to the uh, target cells to die. And the combination of these two, um, let's say, arm of the responses, uh, that's what we call cellular mediated rejection. So we have the presence of CD4 producing interferon gamma, macrophages, and CD8 um, cells doing uh, perforin and granzyme. Of course, this is a um, simplified chart in vivo and real life, things are more uh, complex than that. So again, uh, just to remind you, the T cell, they can have two types, they can see two types of signals in the APCs. And one is the co-stimulation that induces a more effective response and the other one is the co-inhibitory molecules. And the focus of the talk today is about the PD-1 and PD-L1 signaling. Um, it's really well known stud these days. Now it's, uh, it's inducing, um, it's being used as an anti cancer therapy, the blockade of that. Uh, and in transplant, is kind of everything you read about tumors in transplant the other way around. So we're trying to uh, increase the signaling for this pathway in order to inhibit the T cells to and avoid the, 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 the destruction of the, the transplant tissue. So the PD-1, uh, it's uh, engaged by its ligand that's called PD-L1. Um, and after it happens that, so the PD-1 recruits this phosphatase that's called SHIP-2. Uh, I think Info um, nicely introduced this topic yesterday as well. Uh, so this phosphatase can uh, inhibit all the downstream signaling of the TCR, and this will lead to less cytokine production by the T cell, less proliferation, and less cell survival as well. So just uh, a little bit of text here and an introduction. The PD-1, it's always upregulated after T cell is activated. 
uh, and after uh, after the, the the antigen is clear, uh, the expression is downregulated. Uh, if your T cells is is receiving stimulation that's chronic, if the antigen is always there and your T cell is always seeing this antigen, so um, this PD one will be always high and continuous, and this will lead a T cell uh, to be exhausted or dysfunctional. So it's a T cell that doesn't work nicely. But, um, and PD-1 is expressed by all type of T cells, including the Timocytes, CD4, CD8s, regulatory T cells, exhausted T cells, and memory T cells, but not only by T cells, we know now that PD-1 can be expressed by B cells, and K cells, and KT cells, myeloid cells, and even the cancer cells itself, as Enfu said yesterday. So it's a very important pathway and co-inhibitory pathway in our body. So in the transplantation world, we know if we block the signaling or if somehow we disrupt this PD-1, PD-1 signaling, uh, we, we, we don't, well, we could protect, uh, sorry, it's critical for the, the rejection, right? So actually, if we, we mess up the signaling, we don't have reject, uh, we don't have tolerance. We're gonna have more rejection, right? And it was described in heart and liver and skin transplant models. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. So for example, here, um, and this model is gonna use a lot. So what we do, we 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 have in la in the in the laboratory, we have different strains of animals. And each strain of animals is we call isogenic, so they have the same uh, genome, or almost the same genome. And between the strains, the the MHCs are different, right? So the BALB-C has different alleles of MHC than the black six mice here. So when we transplant a heart from a BALB-C mice to a, a black six mice, this this heart is rejected within seven days, it's very, super fast. So we call this a uh, major mismatch. So all MHCs are different here. So it's a super strong, um, super strong uh, immune response against that transplant organ. However, if we give a uh, few doses of immunosuppression, here we are using ctla 4 ag that's a immune suppression that blocks that signal too that I, I, I showed you before, uh, we can have this long-term uh, graft survival. So the heart, it, we, we, in the mice actually don't remove the recipient hearts. It's a heterotopic uh, trans, uh, graft. So the graft is sutured in the, in the abdominal cavity of the recipient so we can actually by palpitation just grab the mice and uh, you can feel if the graft is beating or not that's how we evaluate the, the graft survival and if you treat with the ctla 4 g it just beats forever however if we try if we block the pd1 pdl1 signaling using an anti pdl1 antibody uh, here we gave uh, long term so uh, like day 60 more or less, if we start uh, blocking the PDL1, this tolerance is gone. So this path is really crucial to maintain this tolerance in these animals. So uh, we, so what we did here in this work that I'm presenting today, uh, we use a mouse that overexpress, so it has a sustained express of PD1 on T cell, and we call this uh, PD1 transgenic mouse. So uh, this was um, developed by Arlene Sharp. Arlene Sharp is like the the goddess, the PD-1 goddess, um, and they used this this published on JI the first time they did the mouse. This uh, they used this vector. They used the CD2 promoter that is very nice, and um, you can put your the gene what, that you want, and then this gene will be overexpressed on the T cells only in the T cells. And I can show you that. So here um, I have some flow cytometry graphs. I don't know if you're familiar, just go uh, briefly over it. So uh, we have two axes, combination of two axes. Each axis, each axis you have a marker. 
So here I have B2-2A and CD4. Uh, so the more to the right here in this case, more positive for this, this marker, that's the CD4. And more to the uh, upper here in the graph, you are more positive for the B2-2A. So here I have CD4 cells that don't express B2-2A, these are B cells, and I'm gaining or I'm selecting this region to see the PD-1 expression only in those in these cells. So if I grab a wild type mice, this is the PD-1 expression, like this um, black line here. Um, if in, the, in our animals we have a higher expression of PD-1 in the cells, as you can see here in blue, and I use a PD-1 knockout here, a mouse doesn't have PD-1, uh, which the gene is silenced in the whole animal. So you can see that the, the expression is decreased compared with the wild type. And we can quantify that. So here's just a quantification. And actually this is true by uh, for the all T cells subsets that the mouse have. So here I have the CD8 T cells. I have the FOXP3 positive cells, meaning the T-Rex, that, that cells that are anti-inflammatory. And here FOXP3 negative are the other CD4 cells that are more effector and more inflammatory. And also it's not like the mean expression, but also the percentage. So almost 100% of all of these T cells express PD-1. So it's a super sustained PD-1 expression forever. And these mice develop normal, the thymus, um, everything is normal. So let's go uh, for the data itself. So if I use the same transplant model that I explained before, Bob C to black, uh, to black six, fully mismatch heart transplant, right? But here I'm using two types of recipient. The recipient would be either wild type or either PD-1 transgenic. Um, if I just do the transplant um, and do nothing, it doesn't matter. The mice uh, rejects the same way around day seven, right? But if I give one, one dose of the immune suppression, the CTLA-4-AG on day two, so uh, since this response is very strong, this rejection response, we just give one dose and we have like a sub acute type of uh, rejection. It's just to dump this strong, uh, a little bit this strong uh, response. So if I do that in a wild type mice here, the black, I have a kind of uh, prolongation of the survival, right? So I have a, a little bit, uh, some animals will um, increase the graft survival, but in the end they will reject, uh, or right? But if the recipient is P, uh, PD-1 transgenic, um, actually these mice, uh, these mice don't reject the graft. They are they they are long, they are there long term. So this means that the, these mice are more prone to uh, to the tolerance um, than the wild type mice. And if we look at the vessel, so here um, it's a picture, it's a cartoon, what happens in theory when you have uh, allograft vasculopathy. So in the heart, once you like you start to reject the heart, you have this uh, intimal thickening of the vessels and the arteries. Um, and we can see here in the animals. So here on the left, first I have just a picture of the um, heart tissue. And you can see here in the left, the wild type has a lot of these, you know, purple dots. This means of the a huge lymphocyte infiltration here. That's kind of, uh, this is uh, 50 days after the transplant. And in the PD-1 transgenic, this tissue is much cleaner, right? So you see less these dots, less infiltration. And if you look at the vessel itself, it's very like, much like the cartoon here. Um, the wild type is kind of starting to close you have this intimal thickening here that you cannot see in the PD-1 transgenic mice. And actually, if you get, if you look 100 days after the transplant, 150 days, the vessel is still really good and looks very clean. So this is um, pretty remarkable, uh, at least in animal models, and it's a very nice response compared to other models. So one really interesting experiment we did, so we asked, um, okay, so we know that the T cells that are overexpressed PD-1, um, they are um, they are required to this, or if you do that, you're gonna have this long-term graft survival. But do we need the ligand? Do we need the the, the graft to express PDL1? And you, do we need this ligation between PDL1 and PD-1 
um, in the T cells. So what we did here, we use um, a wild type mouse, BALPC, or a BALPC that doesn't have PDL1, so it's a PD1 knockout. We just silence the gene. And so the heart itself is gonna have or not the ligand, right? So um, and then we transplant these two types of grafts into uh PD1 transgenics. And actually, if we give a shot of CTLA4G, um and um so we don't we don't see that prolongation anymore in the PD1 transgenic recipients, meaning that we need the graft itself, the tissue itself needs the ligand in order to this whatever is happening these PD1 transgenic cells, but to these T cells to to uh, avoid this rejection response. So um, we need the ligand as well uh, in this um, in, in this scenario. So first to conclude the first part. So the selective T cell over, uh, overexpression of PD-1 promotes uh, allograft tolerance in combination with just a single dose CTLA-4-AG in a cardiac transplant model. Uh, and this requires expression of, of PD-1 by donor allografts. So after next, we try to understand why that's happening, right? So we have a very nice phenomenon, but now we have to, uh, okay, well, so what's going on? What's the mechanism? So, um, we took the T cells. So after the transplant, uh, 20 days after, 21 days after the transplant, we we collect the T cells of this uh, graft recipients, and we kind of challenge these T cells with donor cells again. So we kind of re-stimulating these cells in vitro, so we know if they are less or more prime, or if they saw or less, more or less the antigen. And actually, this. Uh, PD1 transgenic T cells, they are uh, less primed. We have, we see a trend in less interferon gamma. We have less L6, L4, and the L17 uh, response is gone. And um, we then kind of characterize the, the, the phenotype of these cells inside the graft. So uh, when I was doing experiment, I always um, check the T cells in the graft, the T cells in the other lymphoid organs like the spleen and the lymph nodes. And I have, I must say like the most important responses in all type of transplant um, um, research, it's in, inside the graft. So a lot happens inside the graft. So if we take the T cells, so here I'm focusing the CD8 T cells uh, and uh, the, T, the CD4 T cells that are not T-Rex, right? So the Fox P3 negative cells. Um, and what I'm evaluating here, I'm evaluating the expression of other uh, co-inhibitory molecules in this PD-1 on um, transgenic cells. Why? Because it's known. So um, there is a guy here uh, in Boston, uh, VJ Kutru, uh, that works a lot of with this co, actually he's the discoverer he discovered a lot of those co-inhibitory molecules. And um, he has a paper showing that actually these molecules, they are like expressing blocks. So once you have one, you're kind of gonna end up having all of them or a lot of them. Um, so in this experiment, we are trying to map what's the phenotype of this PD1 intergenic uh, T cells that are infiltrating the graft. And actually, um, here, uh, I have three groups. Uh, I just have a native, a naive heart, a heart that wasn't transplanted at all. Um, I have a graft from that I harvest from a wild type recipient and a, a graft that I harvest from PD-1 transgenic recipient. And um, as you can see, the PD-1 transgenic has more expression of CTLA-4, more lag tree, and more TIM tree, right? And, um, so meaning that indeed looks like this um, increase of expression of PD-1 is kind of um, leading and um, to the expression of the other receptors. But these also these markers are also indicative that these T cells they could be non-functional.
differences in the viral titer of this uh, between the P wild type and PD1 transgenic mice, meaning that pressing this uh, mark. Could, could you please wait a little bit because we lost the connection with YouTube? Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I can't believe it. Yeah. Oh. Opa, sumiu. Ah, tô vendo ali, ó. It's still working for me. Yeah, for us it is, but it's not transmitting. Ah, voltou. Okay, good. Ready? You're back? Go, yes. I uh, still guys can see my screen. Yes. Okay. So we thought we had lost the connection, sorry. So actually, as I, I was saying, uh, there is no difference in the viral load of these mice. So although they overexpress these co-inhibitory molecules, this looks like these cells are not exhausted because they are able to fight or mount an optimal immune response against the virus. So just to summarize the second part, the PD-1 overexpression pairs to cell proliferation, both in vitro and in vivo. Sorry, I didn't show the in vitro data. And this PD-1 transgenic can uh, mount an optimal uh, immunological response to acute viral infection, despite this high, high PD-1 expression on T cells. So what's happening then, right? So uh, although the, last, the, the T cells are less prime, it's not a very convincing data, right? So, okay, it might, maybe it might be the T-Rex. So what we did, we have this animal that's, um, so FOXP3, FOXP3 GFP. So just to remind you, the T-Rex, they express this very specific trans transcription factor that's characteristic of these cells. And in these mice, this um, transcription factor is green. So we can track these cells by flow cytometry, immunofluorescence, whatever you like. And then we, cross these mice with PD-1 transgenic mice. So now we have a mouse that has a lot of PD-1 and the T-Rex are green, basically. So for our surprise, what we found was that um, actually this, the PD-1 transgenic mice has less T-Rex. So either if you quantify in percentage or the absolute number, these animals has uh, have less T-Rex. Um, in the drain lymph nodes, this is in the graft. Um, and then if you look the spleens, the same, or if you look the time. So either the transplant mice or the naive mice from, mice from the baseline, they have less T-Rex. However, if you look the function, so if you get these recipients and look the function of the, the these T-Rex inside the graft, uh, so here I'm staining for CD4 and lab, and this is gating in the Fox CD4 Fox P3 positive uh, T cells is gating the T-Rex. Actually, this lab is the um, um, kind of the membrane, the G T uh, TGF beta uh, membrane. You, you can see that these guys are expressing more TGF beta in the graph, the the T-Rex from this PD1 transgenic. And actually, this is also true for the L10. So it's not an easy staining to do intracellular um, cytokine staining from the cells from the graft. But um, I think uh, it worked out well. And um, we can say that these cells are, these infiltrating cells are producing more L10 when the, the hosts are is PD1 transgenic. So looks like the T-Rex are kind of more functional. Although these mice have less um, T-Rex, they are more functional. So, okay, so if that's true, if the T-Rex is mediating any response in these animals, what about if we deplete these T-Rex? What happens to the graft survival? So what we did here, we did same model, bulb C uh, to PD-1 transgenic recipients, but um, we well, uh, we use an antibody that is known to deplete the T-Rex, is anti-CD25, right? Um, and once we do that, uh, you kind of lose that long-term graft survival in these animals, meaning that you need this T-Rex in order to have this tolerance response in these PD-1 transgenic uh, animals. 
okay, and then we were not satisfied with that. I say okay, how these T Rex um, are doing that. Now, what what is special on that and that they do that? So um, I don't know if you guys are interested or work with T Rex. Uh, we checked some mTOR pathways not changed. We checked uh, phosphorylated STAT5. That's a signaling pathway for the T-Rex actually is decreased in the PD-1 transgenic. And then we end up doing this um, mRNA RA and we uh, about, uh, doing in the wild type first the uh, PD-1 transgenic T-Rex. And uh, one of the molecules that pop out besides the PD-1 gene was the ICOS. So, and then we thought to uh, investigate deeper um, about this molecule in this T-Rex. So actually, ICOS is another um, co-stimulatory molecule that are involved, is as kind of a signal too as well. And um, it's being reported, especially in tumors, that the tumors have a lot of ICOS, ICOS positive T-Rex that, and these cells they express, they do a lot of L10 and they also co-express the other inflammatory marker, uh, co-inhibitory uh, receptors as the same as we are seeing here, right? So uh, we, we, we went to in vivo and we confirmed that actually the T-Rex in the transplant mice, uh, when the recipient, the PD-1 transgenic T-Rex, they actually express more ICOS and actually almost 100% of them are ICOS positive as well. And they also express more CTLA-4 that is known also to mediate the, the immune response, like the TREG uh, mediate res, uh, responses. And we, we saw also an increased expression of TIN3 and the AHR. So again, uh, our last experiment, okay, if ICO is important, so let's block ICO in vivo and see what happens and see if it's um, this uh, tolerance is induced by the overexpression of PD-1 is uh, ICOS dependent? And it, the answer is yes. So uh, if we block ICOS uh, for uh, four shots of ICOS, 100 micrograms, we is, is very important to uh, roll out here that, to point out here that this dose doesn't prolong graft survival itself. So if I grab wild type animals and use this anti icos I won't see a very strong prolongation or any, almost any prolongation of survival. So um, it could be, we are trying, we have to do more uh, experiments on that, um, but looks like um, this effect might be mainly on the T-Rex. So when we lose the ICO signaling, um, this PD-1 transgenic cannot uh, cannot uh, tolerate these uh, hearts again uh, anymore. So uh, just to summarize, this PD-1 um, transgenic animals, um, they have less T-Rex. Uh, their T-Rex are required for graft tolerance, although they are uh, lower numbers and they are more functional because they produce more than and more uh, lap. Uh, I didn't show you, sorry, but um, this effect's not mediated by STAT5 or mTOR inhibition. And we, we think that ICOS has a critical role uh, in this response. So just final conclusions. Uh, so after you have your heart graft, um, we still have to investigate if that's true for other organs. Uh, so your T-Rex are expressing a lot of PD-1 and ICOS can inhibit effector responses and it will, this will lead to, the, to a prolonged graft survival. And uh, so we think that's one of our um, working, um, working hypotheses in the lab that this pathway is a promising target in transplantation, uh, especially if we uh, be using synergy with co-stimulation blockade. So I'm, uh, I would like to thank everybody that helped this work to be possible. Um, the folks in my lab, uh, Peter Sage that helped us with the flu infection model, Arlene that, and Allison that gave us the mice, um, and all the funding source, uh, especially the American Heart Association. Um, thank you, thank you for sticking uh, with us. I know it's a 
Libertadores night in Porto Alegre is a big night and I'm happy to take any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thiago. That was fantastic. I hadn't seen that data. That was exciting. We talk mostly every day and we talk about something else. So we're doing a lot of different things. I just want to yeah. point out that the the picture in the back and the wall on the on the wall on the back, that's our latest article together. It's a cover of the Fab's journal. Pretty exciting. It's pretty nice. Mauricio Higo. Um, Mauricio uh, Rigo's um, picture, so that's pretty cool. So um, I'm waiting here for the questions to arrive. And in the meantime, um, I, I couldn't help noticing um, from your data, the markers for these cells that you need to get your effect, the tolerance to the graft, um, ICOS and P1, yeah. um, they are shared by TFRs too. Have you ever thought about this? Could they could they be related to antibody control? So we, we the, okay. Yeah, so um so in this model that we use Bob C to Black Six, um, mm -hmm. we check the antibody response TFR, TFA, Jalo formation of allo antibodies and it's not changed. Uh but we think that it's because this model is very cellular mediated rejection, so the antibody okay. doesn't play a role in the rejection okay. itself. But if we if we did the same thing in a chronic rejection model, which is the BM two alpha, it's a mouse that does the, just like the class two, uh, it's a black six, it's a different um, black six class two, um, and it does protect. So for sure, there is a, something with the antibodies, um, but. Also, the BM12 mouse, it's the rejection, it's made it more about auto and auto antibodies, not allo antibodies. Um, but it's protective. I mean, one of the main things in terms of pathology is vasculopathy, right? The fibrosis of the vessels. Yes. So we we if we look if you look the vessel in the BM12 model, like they hundred after transplant it's clean, it's gone. Like the pathology score is like zero. So it's kind of powerful um, as well. But we focus the mechanism in the TRAG and the, the cellular response just because the model requires that. Okay, no, that's fine. I mean, I was just curious. And the other thing is like from the beginning when you start looking, it's very interesting because it's, um, you can't really tell about um, what is the role of the PD-1, PD-1 axis because um, it's definitely important, but it's so hard to pinpoint. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when you have, when you have the, the cells that are, you said they are less primed in the PD-1 knockout, and you yeah. say the IL-17 is gone, right? Yeah. So you see no IL-17. And then, um, if you treat with the, the CLA4 IG, you, you have tolerance, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering if you don't treat with the CTLA4 IG, but your cells somehow don't make any IL-17, I mean, is IL-17 the one that's mediating the CLA4 IG effect? Could it be? Like, would you have a model where you don't have IL-17 in the T cells and you don't need CLA4 IG anymore? Have you ever thought of that? Am I crazy? No. Is this a crazy no, question? You're, you're right. You're right. Um, so it's just because it's very striking. It's like totally gone. Yeah. So the data about last prime, I'm redoing it. I'm not 100% convinced. Okay. Yeah. Um, because this model is, I just think it's about timing. Um, I, I think we did the experiment on day 14, and I. I'm gonna repeat and do on day 21, which like is closer to the rejection of the controls. Okay. Because we know this model, um, it's very interferon gamma mediated. Mm -hmm. um, and you have interferon gamma, it's there. Yeah. You, you can yeah, see gamma. Yeah. Um, so it's very TH1 and CD8 mm -hmm. mediated this, this, this model. So it's, 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 it's a model, right? So it's any, like any other model people are 
trying to translate a lot of mice data, but actually it's very model dependent. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know that. I, I, I have to think more about that. But no, it, yeah. it's really interesting. I didn't know about the 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 receptors being expressed in block. Like this yeah. is to me. I didn't it's know. It's a very nice paper. It's a nature paper from Cultural, and it mm -hmm. it's crazy. They did RNA seq. Crazy and it's rich lab, right? So they did RNA seq like five minutes. So they simulated with TCR, and you know, in vitro the T cell they differentiated and they did RNA seq like five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and they kind of see what's the whole transcription um, um, profile to the differentiation of the cells. It looks like CMAF is one of the main transcription factors that's kind of inducing this uh, whole block of conhibitory molecules to be expressed on the surface of the T cells. Mm, okay. um, what is lead, I mean, we have a force in PD-1. I still trying to find why um, I, I haven't checked CMAF yet, but um, I still I have to check if that's the case for this mouse or something okay. else. No, oh, this is cool. This is important for cancer, probably. Okay, so Elisandra has a question. Elise? Thank you, Thiago. First, I, I would like to ask you to, to close your presentation, your, your sharing. Oh. Very sorry. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem. It's just for for the transmission get better. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm pretty sure that all of our students could follow your excellent explanation about the mechanism of uh, related to uh, heart and uh, allograph uh, organ rejections. It was very, very nice, very didactic. Uh, it's a very complex uh, subject, and I think that you are just perfect to explain the mechanism and then after this to explain your data. Uh, I I was thinking something, and then I uh, I would like to to know if it, it makes sense. Um, uh, thinking in the in the patients, uh, having a, a translational view of the 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 transplant organ. Do you think that um, it's a um, good strategy to evaluate the, P uh, the PD PDL1 expression in the donor or in a and in the in the guest in in, in order to 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 check for uh, stimulate uh, a therapy to stimulate the signaling? Yeah. Um so um, yeah, so my boss, uh, he's a clinician. He's the clinician. I'm not a clinician, just to point out. So, uh, but humans are a bit, a little bit trickier because um, there are some papers showing that actually the PD-1 positive T-Rex in humans, they are less functional. It's kind of the opposite that what I'm saying, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm seeing with these mice, right? So um, we still don't know if it's the, if it's the treasure of the PD-1, if there is a threshold that, okay, if you have more until some certain treasure, you're more suppressive, but if we go up or that, you're gonna be, you, your cell is gonna be exhausted, right? It's really okay. hard. We don't know that. So there's, it came out just two papers um, in in humans, kind of saying the opposite. They are evaluating the T Rex, the PD one um, uh, expression, and it less it's less function functional if the T Rex express more PD one. So um, ah, okay. Yeah, the answer is I don't know. Based on my data, I don't know if you do a, a cell line, right? Or if you are doing a T-Rex therapy, right? Where you're gonna expand the T-Rex from this the recipient and then expand in vivo and give to the recipient, right? Like I, they are trying to do like cell, cell therapy, right? In theory, if you, I don't know, transfect this T-Rex with the plasmid that will make them express PD-1 all the time, it was supposed to be better, right? But 
based on these papers uh, from cancer, they are all from cancer, we don't know, right? But on the other hand, from the cancer field, if we grab the ICOS positive um, T Rex, right, they are inside the tumors and they are more suppressive and they express a lot of PD1. So for sure, we have to look more into that. It's just most of the materials we have is from circulating cells. And I don't think they are good, you know, they, are, they don't reflect what's happening inside the graft, right? Even though we can get biopsies sometimes, it's very painful, it's not nice for the patients and um, they just get the biopsies for clinical reasons. Um, it's really hard to get cells from the graft itself, but I would. Of expression, but uh, is related also to the functionality of the cells. They have to work properly to have the the, the expected effect. So it's. Uh, I thought about the expression because it's more easier to do. You can just take the cells and uh, analyze it by flow cytometry, but the the functionality of the cells is. It's not so easy to to, to yeah. analyze mainly in patients and also these patients they the transplant patient they took a lot of immunosuppressants like the doses are really high a lot of tacrolimus you know and this just killed the t-cell right like just i mean so any marker that this t-cell could be expressing is very low there so maybe just a little bit of increase would be enough you know maybe tumor is the other extreme so if you have a scenario that you're taking immunosuppression and you have almost zero PD-1, and then if we could somehow just increase a little bit, that would be enough to make this T-Rex more functional, you know? Maybe tumor, you have a lot of antigens all the time and then oh. it would be bad for the T-Rex. So I think it's just a matter of balance and a matter of timing and um, yeah. Yeah, but but still, it's it's in the model. It's very nice how you have because in a transplant, the cells are going to express a lot of PD one. This is going to happen because they're going to get activated. Uh, if the guy, if the per person that's receiving the graft has CMV, they're going to have more PD one, even more PD one, right? Yeah. The cells. This is expected, and a lot of people have CMV. And what's interesting is that when you have that and you add the CTLA four AG, you have a very nice response. Very nice yeah. protection. Yeah. And this is interesting. If you take back to what Mfu talked to us about yesterday, how Stella 4 plays with the ligands that, you know, that stimulate the T cells, CD28 yeah. uh, dependent. So, for example, when the CTLA 4 AG hits, it's binding to all those structures that the CD80 and CD86 can display on the surface of the antigen presenting cells. So, I, I guess that what's happening is is it's a very nice additive effect it's almost like the the opposite of what we do in cancer where we block the pd1 and we block the ctla4 and we have an additive effect and in this yeah. case you you have the pd1 and the pdl1 axis working and then you're adding the ctla4 <laughs> to the yeah. system so you're getting you know that's my my look at your data. This is what I'm seeing. I think it's very yeah. promising if it works in people. That could be very exciting. This was the first, CLA4AG was the first immunotherapic drug, yeah. first uh, checkpoint blockade drug. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know they are doing some trials with CLA4AG. I don't know the contest and what yeah. cohort of patients, but I know it could it's- that could be that PD-1, PD-L1 expression is crucial for for CLA4IG yeah. to work it yeah. Yeah. in the clinic. Yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah.
Very nice. I don't know if we have any more questions. I don't think so. I haven't gotten any. Ah, oh, okay, one more. I have a very simple question, but I'm so curious. Go for uh, it. I, yeah, it's a, it's a very simple question, uh, but I will enjoy it that you are with us. Uh, uh, how do you do the heart transplantation in the mice? So for I don't because do it. Because I mean, it no. should be very difficult to do it. Yeah, I don't do it. I'm not a surgeon. You have to be a very, it's like a microsurgery. So you have to be a very, very skilled, skilled surgeon. So we have a team of surgeons that do for us. Um, and they are great. It's very hard. I would never be able to do that. It is hard. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's very as easy I said, to kill them out. So it's not. <laughs> Yeah, you don't take you don't take the heart out of the recipient. You basically um, add a you, second. You graft, uh, you graft the, the uh, second heart to the abdominal cavity of the recipient, right? So it's not like a life sustaining surgery. It's just um, yeah. it's just a model, but it, it's 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 good. You have the same features that you have in humans, and you can see easily. Because the heart beats, so you can see easily if it's rejected or not. Um, just add your finger to the heart and see if it's yeah. Beating. It's like you grab the mouth as you do like IP injection. You just put your thumb on the belly. You can feel it beating or not. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, that's how we do, and it it's the most oh most common for solid organ transplant at least. Um, model that is having basic research. Chago has come a long way from the skin transplants that we used to do in the lab back at Pulki. I'm, I'm still we were... <laughs> oh, <laughs> we had... In the lab at Pulki, we Chago put the, the med students to study yeah. microsurgery and then do the transplants for him. He was just like bossing them around. You guys do the, the skin graft. <laughs> and we're going to do the they science like and all they that. Like it. Even my daughter, my daughter went to do school oh, transplants yeah. for us. It was pretty the cool. big boss. Yeah, he was just he was the boss of the med students, the surgeons. That was pretty cool. Oh, that went really nicely. Um, one of our students uh, is one of the, uh, the the undergrads is now a she's now a physician, and she won an award last year for our paper. It was in. Uh, uh, Nature Communications. She was a co-author, so it worked pretty nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. And now cool another text. student is working with lung transplants. That's true. Yeah, so was... that's true. The second one is working on lung transplants. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so, cool. They're mm -hmm. all grown up. Oh all grown my up. god! Getting old. Old. Okay. Wow. It was really nice. Congrats. Really, really there. nice. Con very promising. Congratulations. I'm excited. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for organizing and having me. Thank Enjoy you for the coming. Summer. I will face minus whatever now outside. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Take care. Bundle up. Okay, Have guys. Some wine when you get home. Bye. Yeah, sure. Thank you bye so bye. much, Elias. I guess it's. Thank nice. you. Thanks for everybody I'm... for watching. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ja. Thank you, Thiago. Thank you everybody for the patience, but uh, finally we have a very nice seminar and then I'm, I'm very proud that we persist. You know, Brazilians are like that. We never give up. Yes. We are that and, that. And, uh, and then try the webconf and then try the Zoom and then try the meet and finally we succeed. So uh, because of and that, we're all that's it. Yeah. We're yeah. All <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much. Uh, so I think that you can close the session. I would like to thank the participation of uh, our students, professor. I would like to thank for the question that the participants made. And tomorrow we have more. I I hope with less emotion. We are trying to solve this this uh, tech, uh, tech, technical problems that we have uh, today. And we hope tomorrow to start at 6.30 p.m. 
and tomorrow we are going to talk about tissue engineer tissue engineering sorry so everybody are uh, uh, invited to stay with us Thiago, Jean, if you would like to stay with us i can send the, a new link a link that works that <laughs> so we can enjoy tomorrow we will uh, have uh, as uh, speakers do, uh, Dr. Veronique Moulin. Uh, she is colleague from from Josevini in the University of Laval. And then we will have a new woman, business woman. Can I say that business woman, Carolina Cagliari. That uh, she is has a a, um, a factory, how a business with uh, stem cell and tissue res regeneration. I think this is going to be a very nice talk. So I hope to see you tomorrow. Have a, night, have a good night and take care because the pandemic didn't, didn't finish yet.